Welcome to Mega 10. I am Monica. And I am David. A quick reminder, please give us a like, hit the bell, and subscribe to our channel. You can also join the VIP front row to get early access to all our upcoming videos. Thank you for being here and supporting us. David, today we are taking on a topic that has been building piece by piece, almost like watching a doorway into the next decade of financial systems being formed in front of us. Stellar has been on this path for years, but the pace at which things are coming together recently feels like a major step closer to production level institutional grade integration. What's interesting is how all the threads now form a single picture. We are not talking about a chain with speculative hype. We are talking about a chain that's actually being used by governments, aid agencies, card networks, cloud platforms, and major regulated asset managers. And what really stands out, David, is how these integrations are starting to reshape the competitive balance between open blockchain rails and the closed networks that used to dominate cross-border payments. I agree, Monica. When you stand back and observe the pattern, you can tell something structural is happening. The moment Visa and MasterCard begin wiring their payment ecosystems into a public blockchain like Stellar, even in small steps at first, it tells you that the conventional model of settlement is undergoing a pivot, and the pivot is not towards some fantasy decentralized world where everything becomes peer-to-peer. -peer. It's something more subtle. It's the hybrid model where the front-end experience remains familiar to consumers and merchants, but under the surface, the ledger that resolves obligations, moves liquidity, and settles multi-currency flows becomes open, programmable, and instant. Stellar in particular is showing up repeatedly in places where those qualities matter the most. Predictable costs, no probabilistic finality, low energy use, and the ability to handle authorized asset control features at protocol level. The hybridization is what surprised many people. Instead of seeing public blockchains replacing everything, we're seeing them blend into existing rails in ways that remove inefficiency without pulling down the whole legacy system. The Visa Wirex integration is a perfect example. The card swipe looks exactly the same to the user, but settlement is done through regulated stablecoins on Stellar. It bypasses the need for idle capital stuck in Nostro accounts, and it reduces operational drag. The user never sees the chain, but the Treasury Department certainly does. And that kind of integration doesn't happen if the chain isn't stable. For Visa to settle obligations on-chain, even if it is only for selected flows and selected members, they need deterministic finality. Stellar prioritizes safety in its consensus model. If anything threatens consistency, the network simply halts, rather than splitting into competing ledger states. Banks can tolerate a temporary halt, they cannot tolerate a fork that creates conflicting ownership. That's why Stellar fits these institutional workflows. The settlement being instant and final is not just a convenience, it's the core requirement. It's that same combination that caught the attention of humanitarian organizations. They don't need high-throughput gambling apps or liquidation bots. They need reliability. They need audit ability, they need speed and low cost. When UNHCR started issuing USDC-based aid through Stellar, it solved problems that traditional rails simply couldn't solve, especially in crisis zones where the banking infrastructure is either damaged or not trusted. Suddenly, displaced people could receive funds almost instantly and cash out through MoneyGram locations without the overhead of going through bank accounts. The entire chain of custody of funds is visible, down to the last cent, which satisfies donors and auditors at the same time. And if you look at the technical architecture of those aid programs, it's a great demonstration of what open rails can do when used responsibly. The Stellar disbursement platform processes thousands of payments at once, and because transactions are so cheap, you don't worry about overhead. The wallet remains non-custodial, meaning the recipient really owns the funds, and the off-ramp is handled by a regulated local partner. The combination of a public ledger and a regulated cash-out network is powerful. And that's where the pattern starts emerging, Monica. NGOs have embraced these rails faster than governments and banks because they do not have the same institutional inertia. Their objective is direct distribution as efficiently as possible. When they find a faster rail, they use it. The interesting question is whether NGOs adopting Stellar ahead of states will push public sector entities to catch up. When a humanitarian corridor proves more transparent than conventional cash programs, it forces ministries, regulators, and treasuries to rethink how public money is distributed. It becomes a template for a new type of public sector corridor where open ledgers underpin government to person payments. And because the rails are already being used across borders, it highlights how digital identity, AML, and on and off ramps can operate in environments where the traditional banking system might not reach. The identity angle is crucial. People used to assume that public blockchains and compliance were incompatible. But the way Stellar's ecosystem has structured identity and metadata flows changes that perception. With tools like MasterCard Crypto Credential layered on Stellar, the network gains a permissioned overlay that allows verified compliant interactions without putting personal data on chain. 
it becomes a hybrid environment where compliance sits next to the ledger rather than being bolted on through banks alone. It creates new possibilities for aligning AML requirements with open networks rather than trying to ban them or contain them. But that's also where the governance questions start to show up, isn't it? As more enterprise and public sector workloads land on Stellar, the pressure grows for the network to ensure resilience, clear upgrade processes, and a validator set that isn't overly reliant on a handful of organizations. And this is where the recent work on expanding the number of Tier 1 validators becomes so important. If the network is going to underpin tokenized money market funds, visa settlement flows, humanitarian corridors, and national instant payment systems, like what Ukraine's TPN has been piloting, then resilience Resilience and decentralization are not abstract ideals. They become operational requirements. That's right. With tokenized real-world assets, especially tokenized money market funds, the bar is high. Franklin Templeton didn't choose Stellar by accident. They needed asset control primitives at protocol level, predictable execution costs, no risk of gas volatility, and deterministic finality. Their Benji token and the USITS variant that uses Stellar for record keeping are milestones for regulated on-chain finance. When a major asset manager starts storing official shareholder records on a public blockchain, regulators have to take that seriously. It's not a pilot anymore. It's a compliance audited system, and the chain becomes part of the official record keeping infrastructure. And that reshapes the competitive dynamic between stablecoins and tokenized cash equivalents. If a regulated money market fund token runs on Stellar with daily accruals, on-chain shareholder records, and low settlement friction, then stablecoins that lack regulated backing structures suddenly face competitive pressure at the institutional layer. Instead of choosing between fiat-backed stablecoins or riskier decentralized tokens, firms can hold tokenized treasuries directly on-chain and move them with the same speed as stablecoins. It blurs the boundary between money and money-like instruments. That's going to push regulators into new territory. Accounting standards will need to evolve for tokenized MMFs held on public chains, custody rules will have to integrate public ledger record keeping, and treasuries will need guidance on how to classify on-chain holdings that combine the regulatory reliability of a money market fund with the technological attributes of a stablecoin. The policy implications are huge. Just a reminder, remember to like, share, and subscribe. And also don't forget there is a front row seat waiting for you. Join us here at the VIP area. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Now, stepping into the cloud computing side of this discussion, Monica, it's fascinating how cloud providers are approaching Stellar. They're not racing to be the official hosting platform for the chain or anything like that, but they're realizing there's an opportunity to integrate blockchain-based financial automation into their services. Whether it's AWS running agentic finance automation that triggers payments directly from IoT data, or cloud-backed ERPs triggering Sorbonne smart contracts, the direction of travel is clear. Corporate workflows are moving towards automation that depends on deterministic settlement. And if a cloud provider can abstract blockchain complexity through APIs or middleware, they create a seamless pipeline between enterprise systems and on-chain actions. It does raise interesting questions about separation of layers. Stellar's asset model allows everything from stable coins to vouchers to loyalty points to exist on the same ledger. If global brands begin issuing loyalty points or corporate credits on Stellar, we could see a future where those points become interchangeable across companies through a shared settlement layer. It would turn loyalty ecosystems into interoperable digital assets rather than isolated silos. That's a big shift from how things work today, where each retailer has its own point system that cannot be easily exchanged with others. But on Stellar, if the issuer defines the token and the market provides liquidity, the lines blur. And that's going to feed into the competitive tension between public chains and legacy processors. Because the real threat to card networks is not another blockchain beating them. It's the possibility that value transfer layers become so open, fast, and cheap that the processors shift from settlement to pure identity and risk management. They already know it. That's why they're doing these integrations. They know settlement will eventually commoditize. The value is moving to data, compliance, and acceptance networks. And Stellar's predictable settlement architecture gives them a low-friction way to start transitioning. But let's not ignore the long-tail risks. Federated Byzantine Agreement gives Stellar great advantages for safety and speed, but it also demands careful validator configuration. If quorum slices converge too much around certain operators, you get centralization risk. And if the network halts during a busy period, institutions need to know how to manage that. A halt isn't catastrophic, but the operational processes must be clearly defined. As the chain evolves towards higher throughput and more institutional validators join, we'll need to watch how quorum configurations diversify. And that's before we even touch on mixed traffic volumes. When you've got humanitarian flows, micropayments, tokenized assets, payroll, and enterprise settlements happening simultaneously, you need an execution environment designed for concurrency and resilience. 
That's why Soroban's move towards parallel execution and state archival is a big deal. It's not just a programming upgrade, it's a scalability upgrade that prevents state bloat and keeps validator hardware requirements reasonable. This matters for decentralization as much as for performance. And on the regulatory front, the fact that Stellar's compliance architecture maps cleanly to ISO 20022 is a huge advantage. It gives financial institutions a natural bridge from their existing message-based systems to blockchain-based settlement. They can keep their message standards, keep their compliance workflows, keep their reporting formats, and simply switch the final settlement step to Stellar-based assets. That reduces friction dramatically. We also need to talk about how Paxos fits into the multi-chain equation. Paxos expanding into Stellar shows that issuers of regulated stablecoins and tokenized assets are no longer tied to a single chain. They're treating settlement layers as interchangeable components. The chain that offers the best cost, reliability, and compliance features wins the settlement flows. And because Stellar excels in those parameters, it positions itself as a strong candidate for multi-chain institutional settlement. And the geopolitical angle is just beginning to emerge, too. When public sector aid programs run on Stellar, it changes how states perceive public blockchains. Instead of viewing them as speculative networks full of scams and volatility, they begin seeing them as neutral infrastructure that can be audited and monitored. When properly structured, these networks don't replace government oversight. They enhance it. Real-time visibility of flows, consistent metadata structures, and regulated anchors give governments more insight than traditional banking channels. And when central banks start exploring CBDC interoperability, they will look closely at these live corridors. They will want to understand whether their CBDC can interact safely with public chain stablecoins or tokenized MMFs. They will look at compliance layers, governance structures, quorum diversity, state archival mechanisms, and fee markets. They will evaluate how deterministic finality aligns with interbank settlement rules. And if they see a working model that combines public accountability with institutional-grade controls, they will take it seriously. And that's where the stress test scenarios become important. If high-value tokenized MMF flows and low-value humanitarian payments coexist on the same network, the chain must handle sudden spikes or conflicting traffic patterns without disrupting priority flows. Search pricing must remain predictable. Asset issuers must know that their redemption logic will not be delayed. And aid organizations must know that their payments will not be crowded out. That's why the broader roadmap matters. The aim to expand tier one validators, the development of parallel execution, the push for higher throughput targets, and the focus on safety first consensus all tie back to one thing, making Stellar a viable backbone for a multi-sector global settlement environment. It's not trying to compete with Ethereum on DeFi composability or Solana on ultra high consumer TPS. It's occupying the niche where regulated value moves reliably across borders. And that niche is already proving to be much larger than people expected. When you combine Visa settlement, MasterCard credential layers, UNHCR aid distributions, tokenized government bond funds, multi-chain issuers like Paxos, ISO 200022 mapping, Ukraine's instant payment network, and enterprise integrations from cloud-backed automation systems, you can see a pattern forming. It's the pattern of a chain that is becoming invisible plumbing for real financial activity. Nothing sensational, nothing speculative, just proper rails. And this raises one final strategic question. Who gains leverage as Stellar's adoption grows? Is it the chain itself? Is it the asset issuers like Franklin Templeton and Paxos? Is it the on-off ramps like MoneyGram? Or is it the card networks and cloud platforms that sit at the edge of the chain and control user access? The answer is not fixed. It will evolve depending on who runs validators, who controls liquidity, and who sets compliance rules for the ecosystem. That's why governance will be the most important theme to watch going into the next phase of evolution. Drop comments below and subscribe to our channel. David and I are personas to make content more engaging and relatable, not legal and financial advice. Do your own research before making any investment decisions. By the way, keep an eye on interoperability developments because once institutional grade cross-chain settlement becomes standardized, it will accelerate everything we discussed today. See you next time.